Erin, thank you so much for being here on the show. I've really been looking forward to talking to you, mostly after I just got to kind of live with your work in a way through the show at Contemporary Art Matters, where you had um, just incredible pieces included in it. So it's so good to chat now. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Oh, of course. So, you know, I always love to hear about um, the person I'm talking to life. And so I would love to hear a little bit about you, you know, uh, your background, where you grew up, where you went to school and how you really started to get into art making. Okay, great. Um, so I grew up in New York City and uh, both my parents are um, from New York City families. So they, we really go way back in, in uh, New York. And um, I went to a prep school for high school. So it wasn't like art was appreciated, but I wouldn't say very much encouraged in terms of a career choice. Um, but still, it's always something that I pursued on the side. Uh, when I was really young, I used to go to this place that now is closed, but it was called the National Academy of Design. It was kind of like an old school academy, art academy, where you literally, you know, draw and make sculptures from models and very classic art education. And I used to go there and I would just do anything in order to be able to take classes. So I would work in their office and um, I was taking these adult sculpture classes when I was a kid. Uh, and they just, everyone just kind of embraced me there and treated me um, like a peer, even though I was like quite young. And so that was a really formative experience. Um, and then when I was maybe around 16, I did a summer program at RISD. And that kind of like blew my mind open because I had never met art kids before. And I suddenly felt um, kind of recognized and realized that people actually studied art and did it as a career. And it really kind of blew my world wide open. Uh, so after that, I felt like, oh, I need to really do this and I want to go to art school and all this stuff. Uh, it definitely freaked my family out because, <laughs> you know, they were like, where is this coming from? The, you know, it had always been kind of a hobby the way that I talked about it. And then suddenly it became like my life's passion. Um, so that was interesting. And I ended up going to Wash U in St. Louis for undergrad, which ended up being a really good fit because I could go to art school, but it was like housed within more of a liberal arts structure. Um, and I still really liked taking all those like classes, like history and I studied Italian language and all this stuff. Um, and one thing that was cool there is I really uh, was introduced to printmaking, which I had never done when I was younger. And um, they that school had a really experimental approach to printmaking. They also had a really, really large press, uh, which is quite unusual. You know, usually you can't print something much more than, you know, five feet or something on a press. I mean, that would really be stretching it. But this one, you could just go really big. So it was just a very unusual introduction to printmaking. Um, and it really fit me as an artist. Uh, so then, yeah, I went there for undergrad. And then I went to RISD for grad school, um, which really kind of felt like I was coming full circle since that was the place that mm -hmm. I kind of discovered art. Um, and I also have always been very interested in this kind of a meeting place between art and design and um, RISD was a really wonderful place for that because there's uh, I studied a lot of textile design and pattern making even though you know I was in the printmaking department and you could just have these uh, interdisciplinary discussions uh, that were really exciting so it, it was a good fit in that way. I love hearing that because um, one thing that really strikes me with your work and that I love looking at is your play with color and pattern and um, these transparencies that sometimes occur or it looks like how you're applying the paints. I 
I, as like a paint nerd, can sit there and be like, how was this applied? Or is there like, what, what was she doing here? Um, and so it sounds like you've always had this love of, um, you know, where, where design meets art, and then it really flourished at, at RISD. Um, can you tell us a little bit more just about your, your interest in pattern making and how that's really come out in your work? Yeah, for sure. So my mom, you know, even though she wouldn't describe herself as artistic, she actually really is and is a fantastic knitter and uh, needle pointer. So she's always doing that when I was growing up and I, and she also loves pattern. So our apartment growing up was very vibrant, you know, <laughs> lots of patterns, nothing was matching, you know, really like lots of color everywhere. So I was really kind of immersed in it growing up. Um, and even though I myself couldn't, I just couldn't connect to knitting. Um, when I was younger, I ended up studying machine knitting when I was at RISD, which is kind of, um, it has an interesting connection to printmaking because you're kind of building something through a machine rather than just going directly at it. Um, and so I've always been kind of immersed in pattern and and textiles and things like that and so it, I think it's just something I've seen ever since I was younger and always been interested in um so it just kind of naturally just like filtered into my work excellent yeah isn't it funny that these experiences when we're when we're young or children how as adults, they come back in and begin to really feed uh, our work in ways that sometimes we don't always anticipate and it, it comes in. Um, yeah. I'm just looking at some of your work right now and I, I love these, these still lives and flowers and interior spaces. But what's funny about it is I never thought of your work being in interiors. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because mm. of like the flowers and the shapes that I really get invested in and I'm looking at, but it wasn't until recently where I started thinking about that um, and thinking about these objects existing kind of in their own world. And maybe that's why I never associated mm. it with an interior because it feels like you have created this incredible world that's yours, but with like pop references. So could you talk a little bit yeah. about that, about like where you'll have like a crunch bar? I think there's like a Fritos one. I think one of the first <laughs> ones that I really loved of yours that I saw, I think had Fritos in it or something. And I just, <laughs> there's like some comedy as well. Can you, can you talk about all of that? Yeah, I think, you know, for a while, I would say the spaces of my paintings were more kind of like, almost like a stage set or something like the space itself was quite uh, like a, it was almost like an any place like it, it did it, it wasn't necessarily tied to a specific location. Um, and so then I think, you know, it makes sense that you didn't really think about it as interiors in a way, it's more like this stage set that's presenting these objects. Um, and rec I, recently I've been using more concrete surroundings um, as a reference point. So um, I think, you know, being inside my apartment so much during the pandemic really made me kind of obsess over the space in a way. It's like felt like this um, kind of one thing I could really control. Uh, and so that space really became a jumping off point for a lot of my paintings where it sometimes, sometimes I'm referencing the space as it is. And sometimes I'm kind of changing it a little bit, um, but it's still kind of a tangible space that I'm starting off point. Uh, so I think that that's why it's, it's, you know, become more about interiors. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the objects that I'm choosing, I'm really interested in how the objects in the paintings can kind of speak to each other and how they might have one meaning um, when they're like out in the real world, but then in the world of the painting, they could take on a different meaning. Um, and so sometimes if I'm using like a commercial product, like a specific bottle of water or something, I might like be looking at a specific type that I think is kind of speaking in a certain way to what uh, what else you know is happening in the paintings um I kind of like that also these objects that we're really familiar with can start to feel kind of strange 
uh, and and it changes our relationship to them. And then we kind of see them next to these art objects that also in some ways feel like they're becoming more kind of everyday objects rather than prized art objects because they're in the same space as like a LaCroix can or something like that. Yeah, I, I love um, how you place them together. And then recently, or I guess over the past couple of years, maybe there's also been the addition of um, like children's toys and whatnot. And I love seeing this because still it becomes this conversation of what is this object kind of what of its background when you see it in in the day to day but when you put it within that context it really changes and um i was hoping you could talk a little bit about the impact on having a child like on your work and just as an artist yeah you know it was funny when i when people were like hearing I was going to have a child, they were like, oh, you're going to start putting his stuff in your paintings. And I was like, <laughs> um, I don't think so. Or, you know, I don't, not necessarily. And then obviously I did, um, you know, I think that I end up putting in, you know, what, what I'm seeing a lot of, you know, so, or what's on my mind a lot. So it was kind of natural that those things started to filter in. Um, and, you know, with my last show at Morgan Lehman, I really wanted to kind of directly talk about this kind of pandemic time and, and also this kind of beginning of motherhood and having it all kind of wrapped up together, um, this kind of joy, but also low grade anxiety of just sort of being inside all the time. Um, and you know, it's, I think, like, motherhood is such a beautiful, complex experience. And I, for me, it's been really interesting to kind of understand it through painting. And um, it's been exciting to see other artists also start to kind of uh, take on some of these themes, because they're really rich, you know, there's just a lot there. Um, and I'm I'm interested in seeing, you know, more depictions of motherhood where it's not overly saccharine or, you know, trite or something, because there's nothing about the experience that is that really. Um, I, I think I've, you know, really enjoyed looking at the work of Mary Cassatt and kind of like going back to her prints and just there's this kind of unsentimentality in there <laughs> that I love. Like the, mm -hmm. she has this print I saw at the Met of a woman breastfeeding and, and the woman's face is just like pure boredom, you know, like she's just kind of like staring out into space. And that is, you know, it's like, it, that's part of it. You know, like it's, you're just kind of doing it and it, that's real life. And I, I, I think that that's amazing to see that in a, in an artwork. I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> the idea of, uh, I think culture loves to elevate these ideas of motherhood, which is, you know, great, fine, whatever it is, but when you're actually in it, it is, it's a lot of boredom. It's a lot of, um, redundancy, you know, all of these things that actually make up life, you know, um, it's funny because I was, I was working today in my studio and a lot of times I'll have music on or a podcast or something. And today I was just like, I just need silence because we are constantly saturated with so much. And it's a way to try and escape that redundancy and boredom, which I get because, you know, wants that. But, um, so I, I love how you're bringing that up that we have these, artists who are really commenting on that and um today and then um i also love this idea of the toys and your paintings and whatnot because it's so interesting the idea of like nostalgia as well that can happen with these toys mm -hmm. you know uh and the pattern and the color and that's something i wanted to ask you about in your paintings um is this idea almost of things being a little tongue in cheek or a little bit of humor in your work that I've noticed. Could you talk about, um, like right now I'm looking at a piece specifically, uh, drip drip where there's, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, 
beautiful flowers and then there's like water kind of dripping over and they're cleaning it up which is slightly comedic also mm -hmm. slightly talking about redundancy I guess but um how does that play into your work for you yeah I I, I love you you know I definitely try to have a sense of humor in the work and I want the work to have this kind of multi layered emotions going on where it's funny it's sad it's you know pretty it's all those things and um you know yeah I recently I found it interesting to kind of have these like little moments of chaos like yeah the dripping water that someone's cleaning up or some like one thing that's come into the paintings a lot recently are like bees that are kind of flying around um these kind of like moments that where uh fake nature like a printed uh, wallpaper is being pollinated by a bee like this kind of confusion between um illusion and reality um and you know also I think you know one thing that's really interesting to me about the toys and definitely uh, when I'm picking out these books and toys I part I'm partly picking them out for their aesthetic properties um because I'm, I think a lot of them are really beautiful, these kind of objects for children. And, you know, one thing I've been interested in is how you see this kind of um, history of like modernist painting filter down into like child's toys. So, you know, Matisse is someone I'm really interested in and always kind of referencing in my work. It's like these forms that he used are, are then kind of filtered into this mass market into these like ch child objects and I think that that conversation through time you know and between fine art and and design and aesthetics is really interesting like I I really like those kind of um, echoes that happen where you could have like a really you know fine art painting that's like influencing a book that my baby is reading. You know, I, I, I think that, and we are interacting so much more with the books and the objects than like paintings in a museum. I don't know, I think that relationship's really interesting. So some of the objects from my son that I've highlighted in the, in the um, paintings, I'm particularly choosing those toys because I feel like they kind of, have this aesthetic relationship to this like larger art historical conversation I'm having. I love that. I absolutely love that. <laughs> it almost becomes this interesting cycle, you know, of like um, the private and personal spaces that we have and our um, relationships that we have with our children and our family. But then as, as artists, the relationship we have with past artists, you know, and everything kind of wrapping in together. Um, something I've always wondered about your work is how you start one of your pieces. So can you share a little bit about how you get started on a piece? Yeah, so it's actually like a pretty convoluted process that I've developed um, because I basically, a lot of my schooling is in printmaking. And, but I've also always been really, drawn to painting and when I was in grad school I probably took as many painting classes as I did printmaking classes um and I my practice has always kind of straddled both so at a certain point I decided that I was going to basically incorporate printmaking techniques into paintings because both um fields had kind of things that I wanted and so when I start a work, I it usually starts with a drawing. And sometimes that drawing is based on um, photography that I'm taking. Like I'll literally set up a still life um, or I'll see something that kind of catches my eye and I'll take a photo of it. And that might be the beginning of a painting. Um, but sometimes I'm like constructing the scene. So it, it could be more out of my head. So it, it's, there's like a few different ways I'll start an image. And then once I do that, I kind of figure out what part of the uh, image I want to be printed. Um, and usually those are things that are, I want to be like really graphic, like have like a flat 
um, a, a really flat area or a, like a gradient that's really smooth. Or sometimes I have areas in my paintings that I want to be like weird textures um, that I know I could achieve through printing, but I wouldn't necessarily know how to do through painting. Um, and so I'll cut the stencils for those. And I bring my drawing with all the stencils to a print shop in Manhattan and I'll ink everything up and I print it, print them on the paper. Uh, and then I fix, then I bring the paper back to my studio. I fix it onto panel and then I paint into it. So there's like areas that are printed and I, basically paint around them. Sometimes I'll paint on top of them too. And sometimes I'll paint under them first and then print on top of the painting. So it's, there's a lot of like sandwiching going on, but um, yeah, that's the basic way I go about making these things. Um, and then sometimes I just make mono prints that are kind of standalone works that are just works on paper. I'm fascinated by all of this because I have done printmaking, but I am not a printmaker at all, you know? And so when I saw one of the paintings that was at Contemporary Art Matters, there was an area where I thought, oh my gosh, is she somehow printing from um, almost something, not like a yoga mat, but something that has like a, a texture it, it, on Yeah, it, it is kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. And I loved that. So mm -hmm. you had quite a few artists. We were all sitting there. <laughs> trying to figure out like because this is again something I love to do when I look at work yeah. like what do you think she did this first or that first so hearing this is just um actually really exciting to hear about um how you you sandwich it and build it um so do you typically tend to work on a lot of pieces at one time since you're having to cut the stencils and take them into Manhattan and print or do you just work one at a time yeah, I I um I always work on a number of things at the same time. Um, usually when I go to print, I'll like have a few different ideas that I've started, and I've like cut stencils for those. And so I'm printing like a few things at the same time, or in like a few days or something. And then I will also bring some paper that I don't have a plan for, but I'll just kind of get an idea and I'll just like print it on the fly, like but it's not as planned as some of the other ideas. Um, and and then um, once these things are on the panel, sometimes they'll just sit around my studio for a while. So I will, uh, like, sometimes I'll have one that's like on there for months and then I'll come back to it. Um, and so I kind of work on them at different times or I'll, I might work on them a little bit, put it away and uh, so there's, yeah, usually a few things going on at the same time. I love it. I love it. Um, so I would love to hear like a little bit of what it's like to be in um, a day or a week of your life mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what the studio side looks like. So could you kind of take us into that, like, you know, walking into your studio and a little bit of what you do and if you trade off days with the print, print studio or that's like a once a week thing, I'd love to hear a bit about it. Yeah, um, so usually what I'm balancing between is teaching and, um, and making my work because I teach at a community college um, pretty consistently, usually like a class or two classes a semester. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes when I go there, I'm able to also go to my studio the same day. But usually if I'm teaching there, it's like that's a full day. Um, so there's usually like one, at least one day a week where I'm just teaching somewhere. Um, I used to also teach a lot of printmaking workshops and I still still do it once in a while, but a little bit less now um, that my time's just um, a little tighter. Uh, but then when I go to my studio, I so my studio is like a 20 minute walk away, which I really love because it's kind of a nice time to have by myself and kind of think about what I want to do, just kind of clear my head. And um, my studio is in a building that has a, like about 12 other artists in it and everyone's a professional artist and really serious so you kind of go in there and you you feel there's like a pulsing energy in the air like people are working and um and so it is very motivating and 
yeah, usually because I have this whole process where works are always kind of like in progress, there's, it's kind of rare that I go and I have no idea what I'm going to be working on. There's usually something to work on. Um, and yeah, I just try to kind of sit down and do it. Um, and I definitely am like, you know, if everything can go as I want it, I like to treat it like a day job. Like I, I don't work well at night, even, you know, when I didn't have a kid or I was in grad school, like I still like to work during the day. Um, I kind of, I do like my, I like to be able to have dinner and just kind <laughs> of like, yeah, kind of ease down from the day. Um, and yeah, I, it's, I, I, you know, sometimes I'm doing image research, things like that, but usually I'm just painting and then, and then I'll hit a point where I've kind of run out of things or, or I kind of know that I have a specific show coming up and um, I'm filling out my kind of story that my works are telling. And so I'll have to go back to the print shop and I'll spend a few days just kind of printing. Um, sometimes I'll go just to make prints, but that usually I make my prints when I'm teaching workshops because I kind of have more time there and I'll have these like little extra moments where I can kind of work. Um, and I love being in the print shop. It's a very different atmosphere than my studio. My studio is really kind of quiet. I'm in a room by myself. Um, I, I do like socialize with the other artists in the space, but basically I'm just kind of working. Um, but then at the print shop, it's like lots of people there. People can come up to me, ask me what I'm doing, even, you know, within printmaking, the techniques that I use are really idiosyncratic. Like people see it and they're like, what is this? Um, because I've just kind of figured things out that work for me and, and do them like that. And so that's a really different kind of environment, which I enjoy, but if I was in it all the time, it would probably drive me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but I love that you have this balance you know of being able to go work in your space and it's a little bit more isolated you're you're making you're doing and then having the other side of it you know with being able to to share and have dialogue with others in in the space that's um really really awesome um I love everything that you're sharing and I would love to ask you if you have received any advice along the way or advice that you'd like to give your students or people in your workshop um, that could help them in their, in their own journey artistically. Um, I think, I feel like one advice, one piece of advice that I was given by teachers when I was an undergrad was just you know, that part of being an artist is just kind of like planting seeds and, mm -hmm. and forming connections, but you don't, you don't know what's going to happen from them. And I, I always tell my students to do that too, like have a, have a studio visit, form a friendship, but don't expect a certain outcome because, you know, I've found in my own career, like sometimes I meet someone and then it could be literally 10 years later they're you know emailing me and suddenly it's the it, it's the right thing and it, it's like you just really don't know where things are gonna go and so forming those connections because you want to and because you know they're you know interesting to you like is really important without having like a specific goal in mind of what you want to get from them. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I do find like having those really like rich conversations in the studio with other people, that's something that's a little harder as you get further into your career, because most of the people coming to visit my studio are there for a specific reason. Um, mm -hmm. and, and those aren't the same kind of conversations that you have if you're just having someone over because you want to talk, you know? So I think it's really important to kind of build those moments into your practice too. Mm, that is really wonderful advice. Planting the seeds 
and developing friendships and relationships without really gunning for something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to be this person's friend for this, but rather just letting them organically happen. Um, I think that is really, really wonderful advice. Um, are there any artists that you'd like to give a shout out to today while we're on here? Just like my artists that I love. Any artist you would like. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, there, I feel like there are so many people that I, you know, went to grad school that I, that I'm so close with still, and I really love their work. Um, I've been excited to see uh, my friend Genevieve Lowe kind of get, get into um, doing more installation work uh, based on nature. And um, one of my other good friends, um, Amber Heaton has been uh, developing her own almost like wallpapers recently, which I'm really excited about. Um, this kind of pushing the boundaries of, of printmaking. Um, I'm also really close with Rachel Klinghoffer who shows sometimes that um, Morgan Lehman as well. And um, her approach to color is so wonderful. And um, she creates these little like pockets in her in her paintings, which I find really exciting. Awesome. Yes, I love Rachel's color and um, how she takes the everyday and the history um, of everyday objects and is able to combine them into something new. It's so beautiful. Um, well, Karen, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing uh, a bit of your practice with us. Uh, can you tell us where we can find you online, where you are? So, and of course, we'll share it on our Instagram and in the show notes too. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I love listening also to artist conversations. So it's exciting to actually be a part of one in a podcast. And um, usually my most up-to-date uh, information is on Instagram, uh, which is K-R Letterer. Uh, that's, my that's my name on Instagram. And uh, I also have a website, KarenLetterer.com, which I try to keep pretty up-to-date, but um, I don't usually post when I'm teaching and things on there, which that's all on Instagram. All right. Awesome. Well, we will be sharing that everybody. So you can check out more of Karen's work. It is fantastic. And just thank you again, Karen, for being on the show. Thank you. Right, bye. Bye.